Dear friends, I'm glad to be with you once again. Uh, grateful also for the uh, week that I had uh, away from the office and responsibilities to rest up a bit and work on a few projects at home. Uh, grateful too for my friend Pastor Torgerson and all the other co-workers here who uh, carried on in my absence last weekend. We're coming to another Lord's Day, this one called the Second Sunday After Epiphany. I'll give you a little Greek lesson here. Uh, epiphany is a New Testament Greek word that means like uncovering uh, or appearance. Uh, and all through this season, uh, there's one appearance of Christ after another. Uh, first, as you know, by a star, uh, he was uncovered and made to appear before the uh, Magi who traveled in from the east to try to find him as a child. Uh, then uh, Bible readings during this season talk about how he was uncovered and revealed again on the day of his baptism as the Father's beloved Son. Uh, and today, for example, in the Gospel, uh, he gets revealed and uncovered in the first miracle that he performed by transforming water into wine at a wedding in the town of Cana. Uh, one of the strong ways in which he also is uncovered and revealed uh, is through the love uh, shown by his people. And that's the uh, subject of the epistle text uh, the first reading you're going to hear today, and also the subject that we're going to cover in the preaching. Uh, so we pray God's blessing on all of you uh, who worship with us by means of this video, and uh, ask the Lord uh, to root us more firmly in faith and love all the time. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.
and everlasting God, you govern all things in heaven and on earth. Mercifully hear the prayers of your people and grant us your peace through all our days. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The epistle for this now, which is the second Sunday after the Epiphany, is recorded in Paul's letter to the Romans in the 12th chapter, and it's a portion of this reading that serves as the basis for the preaching today. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving. The one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be sincere, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in affliction, be faithful in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be conceited. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John in the second chapter. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now in the words of the Apostles' Creed, we're going to confess our holy faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Grace be multiplied to all of you in peace from Jesus Christ and from God the Father, who raised him from the dead. As I mentioned, we're going to take a portion of today's epistle. That was the first Bible reading from Romans chapter 12. I'm going to read the words again, starting at verse 9, this time in another translation. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Now let's pray. O oh Lord, we are not worthy to have you come in under our roof, but you just say the word, and we, your servants, will be healed. Amen. In the holy name of Jesus, the great Lord of Epiphany, brothers and sisters, all of you, the world out there, and you may have noticed this, is very good at throwing around the word love. I'm here to tell you that it doesn't always know what it's talking about. That's because frequently people will just call their chosen sentiments or their physical attraction to another person love. And at times, those feelings and those pulls may be rather selfish, sometimes even outright destructive. In other words, I can feel what I call love for other people simply because they're very nice to me. You know, it's always easy to return niceness. Or I may be driven by desire for somebody and call it love because I'm just interested in a little bit of erotic enjoyment for myself. God is love, the Bible says. He's the source of all true love. He's the standard who shows you what it really means. He's the one who gives it to you, and he's the one who kindles it in you so that you can give love, I'm talking about the real thing, to somebody else. In this little epistle, he is showing you what love is by telling you what love does. And the text points out all kinds of things that are worth remembering when it says, Love must be sincere. And there's about three things, I guess, I'd like to emphasize as we chew around on all of this together. The first is that love moves you to go beyond mere words and feelings. The second is that it really goes to work within the family of believers. And the third is that it shows itself to the world around you. Now, if you back up to the start of this particular chapter of the Bible, Romans 12, where today's text is found, the Apostle Paul tells you to live your life in view of God's mercy. You can't really serve God out of fear. I mean, even if you tried to, you'd only be going through the motions, not really loving and serving Him sincerely from your heart. But when you take a really good look at God's bottomless mercy, how he wrapped up all the wrong that you've done in thinking and speaking and actions through all your years, and how he then loaded the whole incurable mess onto the back of his holy son Jesus and let him die in your place to take that away, that mercy can change you. It certainly changed Stephen. That was the first man that we know of ever willingly to die for his faith in Jesus Christ. Religious leaders indicted this man for crimes that he didn't commit, and they started stoning him to death. At that moment, blessed Stephen caught a view of God's mercy. At the moment that they were executing him, he looked up, and in heaven he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of his father God. And all of a sudden it dawned on Stephen, somebody else has walked this way before and done it all for me. And that really took hold of Stephen. And so he didn't hurl insults back at the people who were killing him. 
He just quietly prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, and then immediately added a prayer for the ones who were tormenting him. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. The love that Stephen had taken from Jesus Christ kindled in him also this extraordinary love, even toward men who had lied about him and were torturing him. This was obviously not just talk about love. It was the real, genuine thing. And so today's text begins with the reminder, let love be sincere. You know, the Bible has got to say it just that clearly, let love be sincere. That's because hypocrisy is always sort of crouching there at the door and trying to blend itself in with love. I've seen, for example, situations where Christian people try to excuse very unkind and hurtful talk about another person by calling it prayerful concern. To be honest with you, quite often it was just gossip, pure and simple. But somehow it sounded a whole lot nicer to spray a little bit of deodorant on it, you know, and call it prayerful concern. The deep character of your love on the inside, you see, needs to match whatever holy-looking appearance you want to give to your love on the outside. So in other words, love must be sincere. Otherwise, it isn't really love at all. It's just a fake job. Now Paul goes on in our epistle to show concrete ways that real love behaves toward other people. It goes to work, first of all, within the family of believers. It's personal, it's concrete, and it's real. He says, hate what is evil and cling to what is good. When you're dealing with somebody, you may discover ideas or attitudes within that person that are just plain wrong. The apostle is not telling you that you have to ignore that. You may even need to point it out every once in a while in order to be quite helpful. But you know, when somebody reveals a bit of bad character, it's tempting to push that person away altogether and to think, I'm not going to have anything to do with you ever again. Real love doesn't walk away quite so quickly as that. It doesn't overlook the good that God may have put there in that person. Instead, it tries to find a way to encourage and treasure that good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love, Paul goes on. So don't let pride or any of the other walls that you and I like to put up hold people at a distance or keep them from getting close to you. At the same time, he says, honor one another above yourselves, which means I ought to carefully keep intact the dignity and the respect that I owe to another person. Let that other person worry about preserving my dignity while I worry about preserving his. Live in harmony with one another, do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. You know, in a church family like ours, and when I think of some of you who may be watching us from other church families, it may well be true where you come from, there will be different interests and very different priorities that people feel strongly about. Sometimes it may seem as if the big goal for me is to prevail with my priorities, or to try to get everybody else to come around to my way of thinking or at the very least to see that I've got enough votes lined up at a congregational meeting to make sure that I can uh, come out on the winning side if I can't get them all to come around to my way of thinking. God's Word says, no, no, the big goal is to work toward harmony and understanding in the body of Christ. And in doing that, you and I ought to give very special care in standing close and listening to rather simple, lowly people the ones who can be too easily overlooked or maybe even brushed aside. In these actions, there's a mindset which ought to saturate them all. This is the way the Apostle puts it. He said, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. You and I always have a lot of work to do in our church family and also in our personal lives. In all of that, you ought to stay patient and not try to force open the door of opportunity if God himself is not opening it in front of you. But on the other hand, holding patience should not turn into an easy excuse for just taking it easy and not letting the needs of God's people light what I want to call a legitimate fire under you. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. 
The hope that Christ gives, that helped the early Christians keep their joy alive, even though they were under terrible pressure in the pagan world where they lived. A life of prayer can actually make that possible. The old Bible language here talks about hanging on in prayer. So in other words, don't cut your personal daily practice of prayer too short. Don't gloss over it too quickly. But on the contrary, allow it to loom large and have a real beating heart in your life. Make your specific needs known to God in those prayers in some detail. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality, Paul goes on. In the early church, people didn't have a lot of money to give to the kind of mission funds that we, for example, would support in our Lutheran Church Canada, where we're trying to, uh, you know, support outreach work in other parts of our country or in faraway places like Cambodia or Nicaragua or Ukraine. But even though they didn't have money, they did have dwellings. Remember how Mary and Martha opened up their home one time to Jesus and his disciples. When people did like that, when they fed preachers and gave them a place to sleep, that became a form of mission support. Of course, we don't live in their world, but you know, it still strengthens real ties within the body of Christ whenever you invite somebody over or make an arrangement to sit down with a brother or sister over a coffee somewhere or take the initiative to reach with interest into somebody else's life and not always to wait until they talk first. Now, look, I, I, that's not easy right now in these days of COVID when they're always telling us to keep our distance. But you can pick up the phone, or you can write, or you can find some other way to come close to brothers and sisters who I tell you in advance may find it very sustaining to be on the receiving end of that kind of love from you. Now, when you think of just the stuff in today's portion of Scripture that we've mentioned so far, you realize it's not easy, not even just within the family of believers. See what I mean when I tell you that love reaches beyond mere words and sentiments. And Paul goes on here to make it clear that real love doesn't even quit there. It shows itself to the wider world around you. It refuses to stop at the church door. It reaches outside. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse, he writes. Those early Christians that were getting this letter from Paul, they faced awful resistance in the Roman Empire. Jewish people opposed them because they were convinced that Christianity was a frontal attack on their religion. And the Roman government put pressure on them because the Christian church in those days had no legal right to exist within the empire. Well, St. Stephen, that blessed first martyr that I was telling you about, he showed them the way, didn't he? When opponents of Christ's gospel began to bring pressure to bear on believers, those believers began to answer as Stephen did many times with words of respect and blessing. They actually prayed for the emperor and for those who were torturing them. That, folks, is what you call countercultural. In other words, it runs totally against what most people would do when they're persecuted. The natural reaction in a situation like that is to fight back or to respond in kind or to settle scores. By the way, Christ's love is still countercultural. It doesn't come naturally to people nowadays either. Christ's love really has to lay hold of you personally to set the stage for this. Christ's love shown toward you has to begin shaping your love so that your personal love can move in a whole new direction. Christ's love takes a keen interest in people, whether they happen to be believers or unbelievers. It tries to enter into another person's world, whether the times happen to be good or bad. Rejoice with those who rejoice, the lesson says here, and weep with those who weep. You know, the faithless world out there very often does not react that way. To be quite frank, there are many times, truth be told, when people don't really like hearing all that much about the good fortune of somebody else, because frequently, when good things happen to somebody else, it makes them feel a little bit jealous. But when you very sincerely enter into the joy of somebody who's experiencing joy, 
And even more, when you very sincerely enter into the world of somebody who is weeping, no matter for what reason, the stage is set for people to really take notice of that. The love of Christ in a situation like that can begin to seem more believable, even to non-Christians, because they see it beginning to be painted out in living colors through your love. Standing now at the beginning of this new year, 2021, you and I, as Christ's people, have a lot to keep us busy. Of course, they're telling us the vaccines are on the way, and that's very welcome news, isn't it? But at this moment, of course, at least in our neck of the woods, the reports are that COVID infections are still rising quite sharply. So we can't break open the champagne bottles and start the partying quite yet. It's going to take weeks and even months of restrictions and self-control. Government leaders and public health officials are going to keep prescribing specific things that you and I must do, along with a lot of things that we must not do, to deal with this crisis, which clearly is going to remain with us for quite a while yet. I'm going to say it again. Standing at the beginning of this new year, 2021, you and I, as Christ people, have a lot to keep us busy. That's because we're not just paying attention to what the secular authorities say we need to do to strengthen the community. We also want to open our ears and our heart to what the Lord Jesus says that we can do to strengthen those around us. When Paul wrote those words that we have in front of us today, I was already quoting some of them, you know. Let love be sincere, hate what's evil, cling to what's good, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, Honor one another above yourself. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. And all the rest of it. It's clear Paul didn't know anything about COVID pandemics. But I think it's absolutely breathtaking how the apostolic teaching, which he directed into an entire different time and set of circumstances, will help us big time right now if we lift it off the page and set it free to go to work. Dear ones, we just celebrated Christmas with its incredible message that God's promised Christ came down into our world to lift the sin and the guilt burden right off your shoulders and to carry it in your place all the way from his manger bed to his cross and to do it as your personal Savior. And after the 12 days of Christmas were over, we started to mark Epiphany, this wonderful time when God unwrapped and revealed his Christ even to pagan magi from the east, from a long way away, who didn't really deserve his love, but who needed it just the same, and who rejoiced over it with a whopping big joy. God has given you personally this Christ to be your Savior. And he has uncovered him so that you could see him and would be able to come to him. In this Jesus, he has given to you directly the love that you get nowhere else. The love that covers all your wrongs. The love that puts you back right with God again. And the love that gives you a reason to live with hope and purpose. Whatever kind of new year it is that God gives you even a COVID-laden COVID -laden one like this. Love must be sincere. God doesn't just demand that of you. He's already given it to you in His Holy Son, Jesus. He set you free, and He's shown you the way. It will be such an encouragement to your brothers and sisters when they see that love, and it will give such a very clear witness to God's Christ in this time, when the need is great, and where the people that you can touch are all around, amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, amen. Brothers and sisters, as we bring our prayers to the Lord this day, I'm inviting you to participate in those prayers. Each time I invite you to do that with the words, Lord, in your mercy, I ask you to respond 
with the words, Hear our prayer. Now let's bow our heads to pray. Blessed God and Father, we thank you for your presence among us at this moment. You invite us to pray. You promise to listen. You answer in your wise time and way. At your command and your loving bidding, we beg you to receive the needs we bring to you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As the case numbers surge in this community and in many places, we implore your help. Give relief to those infected with this disease. Enter into the hospital rooms and intensive care stations where people lie gravely ill. Use the healing powers you placed into their bodies when you formed them. Grant them recovery and strength in keeping with your will. Above all, do not let this calamity pry them away from you. Give them hope and faith to stay close to you, since you promise not to leave them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Pour out your spirit and strength on our beloved First Lutheran Christian Academy here in Windsor, as well as on schools and teachers and students everywhere. Despite the barriers that keep them apart, bless teachers with a clear mind to know the best way to convey learning to their pupils. Renew their energy when their burdens press hard. Inspire students also to be eager and appreciative of what their teachers can share. Do not let this school year be wasted. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Open the eyes of your people to be very conscious of the struggles of others at this time of separation and fear. You show us the ways to overcome the social distance, to take the initiative, to reach into a friend's home and life. Give us the heart that will be a reflection of your own caring heart toward us. Use the little bit each of us is able to say and do to refresh the joys of people we know and can touch. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Kind Lord Jesus, you met the everyday need of the family hosting Cana's wedding when their wine supply ran out. Look deep into the life of each of us praying to you now. Help us with the needs of our bodies, our families, and our work each day. Even more, grant us the deep gift of sincere penitence in our hearts for the ways in which we have grieved you, and give us the trusting faith of a little child to believe you have forgiven and still want us. Give us your Holy Spirit to remain close to you in these days of the pandemic, and keep us in true faith to the end. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, and we trust in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
receive the blessing of the Lord, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God the Father, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.